My dearly beloved in Christ, tomorrow being the very important feast and holy day of the Assumption of Our Lady, and especially because when it occurs on a weekday, especially at the early Mass, we're not able to speak at very great length, I would like to make that the topic for the sermon this morning, the wonderful feast day that we prepare to celebrate tomorrow. The Assumption of Our Lady is actually the oldest feast of our Blessed Mother celebrated in the church. So it was a, an opinion or a belief of the faithful from the earliest times that our Blessed Mother was taken body and soul into heaven. And this only stands to reason because it just does not seem fitting in God's plan that she who is utterly sinless and even free from original sin, and of course from any personal sin, she who provided from her own immaculate flesh the matter for the body assumed by the Son of God, to which our divine Lord, the God the Son united himself, that she should be permitted to decay in the grave, that her remains should lie in the grave, in the ground. It just was contrary to all conception of who our Blessed Mother is. But it was only in 1950 that Pope Pius XII, during the Holy Year, proclaimed the Assumption of Our Lady as a dogma of the faith and wrote a new Mass to be, a new proper of the Mass to be celebrated on August the 15th. And in that regard, we could say, it has been said, that the last century and a half are the age of Mary, or at least the beginning of the age of Mary, meaning a greater emphasis in Holy Mother Church a greater emphasis among the faithful to learn about our Blessed Mother, to consecrate themselves to our Blessed Mother, etc. We can go back to the early 1800s and see different apparitions of Our Lady in our times. The Miraculous Medal in 1830, and then we have La Salette, Our Lady appearing at Lourdes, and so many miracles granted at Lourdes. Our Lady at Knock in Ireland in 1879, and then in the 20th century, her apparitions at Fatima. In addition to these, we have had two dogmas of the faith proclaimed, Pope Pius IX in 1854, that of the Immaculate Conception, and then, as I said, Pope Pius XII in 1950, the dogma of the Assumption. There also have been, throughout the 20th century, by the popes, beginning with St. Pius X, various encyclicals or papal documents expanding the theological understanding of the role of our Blessed Mother in God's plan. We also have, I believe it was in the 1840s, the discovery of the book, True Devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, written by St. Louis Marie de Montfort over a hundred years previous, that had been hidden away and was discovered. And so the knowledge of this devotion, this consecration of a total consecration of oneself to Jesus through Mary. So there's been this greater understanding and devotion to our Blessed Mother in recent times in Holy Mother Church and how much we need her. There's an ancient saying about our Blessed Mother, Servus Mariae numquam perivit, which means the servant of Mary shall never perish. And of course, throughout the history of the church, there have been so many examples, so many stories of individuals who through the unique help of our Blessed Mother were preserved from physical death or, and above all, spiritual death. I was on a pilgrimage with the sisters back in June in Portugal, and we went to Fatima, but we also visited a shrine to Our Lady that, that was new. I had never been there before, and it was interesting. The story was that a man was hunting, and this particular location in Portugal, there's a steep cliff that goes down to the ocean, and he was hunting. He was on his horse, and 
and the horse was chasing this animal and came to the cliff and went over the cliff. And he called out to our Blessed Mother and he was rescued and brought back to the top of the cliff. And he, then he had then a shrine was built there and then a beautiful church built there to honor our Blessed Mother at this location. But that was a physical cure. Let us especially think about, or, or preservation, think about the spiritual cures, the conversions, the graces brought by our Blessed Mother to souls who appeal to her. So let us have that deep devotion and trust in our Blessed Mother. Run to her in every need, in every difficulty, for the servant of Mary will never perish. One of the great servants of our Blessed Mother down through the ages was Saint Stanislaus Koska. Now Stanislaus was from Poland and he was sent by his parents, came from a noble family, he was sent to study in Vienna when he was just 14 years old. And he was there with his older brother and with a, a man who was the tutor in charge of their education. And while he was there, he fell grievously sick. And he was going to the Jesuit college, but because the um, Jesuits had lost the house in which they had their students, the students had to lodge in different houses. And it so happened that Stanislaus and his brother were staying in the house of a Lutheran. And he became gravely ill and thought that he was dying, so he wanted to receive Holy Communion. But the man who, the owner of the house where they were staying, being a non-Catholic, forbade it, would not allow the priest to bring him Holy Communion. So here Stanislaus thought that he feared that he might die without receiving Holy Communion. And he prayed to his patroness, St. Barbara, and she came with angels and they gave him Holy Communion. And then Our Lady appeared to him, holding the Christ child, and told him that he would be cured. And she wanted him to enter the Jesuit novitiate. And so he pleaded. He had to go to several different superiors. And they were afraid to accept him because his father was opposed to it. But finally, at the age of 17, he was able to be received as a novice in 1567. And that was in October. But he had this great love for Our Lady, and he had read that when Our Lady was taken into heaven, she cleaned out purgatory. She took all of the souls that were in purgatory at that time with her in her assumption into heaven. Now, of course, that's not a teaching of the church, not a doctrine of the faith, but a pious belief. And so he had this great desire, the next feast of the assumption, to go to heaven to celebrate the Assumption in Heaven and prayed that he would die on that feast. And indeed, he did die between the night, just 10 months later after his um, novitiate, becoming a novice, wasn't quite 18 years old. And he died between the night of the 14th and the 15th of August. Again, because of that great devotion to our Blessed Mother and wanting to celebrate this feast day of the Assumption in Heaven. So it is a very important feast day. And Our Lady reminds us on this feast of the importance of detachment from the things of this world. Because why is it that we fear death? There may be a fear of pain often associated with death. But more often, it is because of a fear of being separated from the things that people are attached to in this world. But Our Lady had no attachment. So her death was really a falling asleep, a peaceful dormition, falling asleep, and then shortly after, taken up into heaven, both body and soul. So Our Lady had no attachment to the things of this world. She also had no regret or, or uh, a sting of conscience. There are those who fear death because their conscience bothers them, and they're not ready to stand before God. But Our Lady desired nothing else than to leave this veil of tears and to be united with her divine Son for all eternity. Indeed, as the saints tell us, it was a miracle that kept her alive, that kept soul in body for those 20 or 30 years after our Lord's ascension into heaven 
when she was such a consolation to the apostles, to the early church. She lived a life centered in the Holy Eucharist, receiving Holy Communion every day from the hands of St. John the Evangelist, her chaplain, her guardian. And Our Lady is a wonderful example to us to center our lives on the Holy Eucharist, to look forward to heaven and not to be detached, to, not to be attached to the things of this world. Why should we fear death? If we desire to go to heaven, then death is not uh, frightening to us, but rather it is the gateway to eternal life and to union with our divine Lord. Let us be devoted to our blessed mother, our loving, wonderful mother, who is so pleasing to God that she was taken up into heaven, both body and soul. Let us look forward to be united to her and to her divine son for all eternity. And let us prepare to celebrate in a worthy manner this wonderful feast of her assumption tomorrow. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.